this bleak and barren landscape might not look like a mountain pass, but that's exactly what it is. I find it really strange to think that this humble trackway has seen so much traffic. In many ways, this is one of the most important roads in American history. Today, I'll be looking at the role bushcraft played in its discovery. Here in the United States, you can have just about anything you want. Even in a small town like this, every possible convenience is on offer. What's more, you can have nearly all of it without having to leave your car. But even in this land of convenience, there are vast tracts of untouched wilderness, areas rich in the ways of bushcraft, and that's the reason why I'm here today. into an area where no motors are allowed. The only way you can get in there is on foot, either your own, or even better still, those of a, a trusted companion. The landscape here is almost the same today as it's been for hundreds of years. This is one of the most important areas in American history. This is the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the biggest wilderness area in the United States. Almost within living memory, it remained unexplored by white settlers. It's an area of amazing beauty. The only real way to explore it, though, is on horseback. I'm following in the footsteps of one of the heroes of bushcraft. His name was Jim Bridger and he was instrumental in shaping America as it is today. To me, he's a kindred spirit. He was a superb woodsman an expert trapper and guide, a true pioneer. Only 170 years ago, these mountains were the stomping ground of a rare breed of pioneer. Men like Jim Bridger, entrepreneur and explorer. Men we remember today as the mountain men. That's the Continental Divide. On this side, all the rivers run down into the Atlantic Ocean, and on the far side of that ridge, they all run towards the Pacific Ocean. Significant feature. Many expeditions had tried to find an easy way for wagon trains to get across the divide, but to no avail. Extending 5,000 kilometers from New Mexico to Canada and 650 kilometers wide, the Rocky Mountains stood barring the way. The promise of riches that lay to the west fueled the pioneering spirit. The race was on to establish a wagon trail across the unforgiving terrain to open up the way to the Pacific. Very little has changed since the first time Jim Bridger rode through here. The only sounds echoing along the trail are those of wild animals. Mm -hmm. 
These would have been rich trapping grounds for the mountain men. Prey animals are fairly easy to see, but predators are much more elusive. But with sharp eyes and keen senses, you can see their sign everywhere. This is uh, exactly the sort of thing I was talking about. You can see there where the tree has been barked by a grizzly bear. He's come along, stripped it off and eaten the cambium underneath. A classic sign that grizzlies are in this area. Come on in, walk on. really is an amazing place. There's so much wildlife here. And travelling by horse, well, it's a fantastic way to see it. You can really feel what it would have been like for the mountain men. It's incredible to think, so recently, this was the western frontier of the United States. Without horses, most expeditions through this area would have been doomed. It's the only way to carry all your equipment across this rugged environment. Whoa, well done, Smith. Come on. Traveling by horse is a fantastic way to get into the mountains. Not only haven't I had the weight of my gear on my back, but neither have I had my weight on my own feet. But of course, this is a partnership. And Slim here has done his part, and so I've got to do mine. The horse always comes first at the end of the day. Well done. These horses belong to Tory Taylor, a conservationist who spends much of his time in these mountains. Hobbles are designed to keep the horses close to camp. They restrict them, but still allow them enough movement to graze locally. With the horses sorted, it's time to get myself together. The mountain men that came out here really were remarkable. Many of them ended up spending most of their lives living in these mountains. To do that, they had to have had a very high degree of bushcraft skill. But it would be wrong to think that they had that before they arrived. For many of these men had come from the cities. They had to be quick learners. In fact, most of them had to learn what they needed to know with the arrival of the first winter. is often found in the smallest details. There's more sign of bear here and uh, I'll just show you this wonderful footprint. This is the track of a grizzly bear. You can see how big that is compared to my hand. The size alone kind of gives it away. And the things to look for are we've got five toes and this is a rear foot. You can tell that because these marks made by the claws are only a little way in front of the toe pad. The grizzly has longer front claws, which he uses to break open rotten logs and to dig for food. He's looking for insects, things like this. There are also human footprints here, which are quite fresh. But the bear is on top of the human footprints, so it's come along afterwards. It's great to be out in such a pristine wilderness. In places like this, I like to camp out close to nature, just under a lightweight tarp. It protects me from the rain, and there's plenty of space to spread out underneath. If you're living outdoors like this, you have to take certain precautions to protect the wildlife that lives here. Of course, a lot of people think that when you camp, bears are a problem. 
Actually, it's the other way around. It's people that are the problem. If the camps run badly and food scraps are left around, bears come in and become habituated. They get used to taking scraps or even gifts of food from people. And when bears and people come into close proximity, obviously, at some point, there's going to be a problem. Usually, it's the bear that ends up the one being hurt. Fortunately, at this campsite, I'm lucky because I can use this bear box to store my food. And you can see it's built like Fort Knox. It's actually a regulation that your food must be secured away from bears, either in a box like this or suspended from a tree. You won't always have access to a bear box, but there's a fairly easy way to store your food if not. Bushcraft is all about being adaptable. I learnt this technique of throwing a rope into a tree from a tree surgeon and it works perfectly for this purpose. The most important thing to remember though is to seal your food in airtight bags to conceal its scent before you suspend the bags in the tree. If the bears can't smell your food, the chances are they'll steer clear of your camp. Well, that's me done. I've just got one last job to do, and that's to light a fire. I only need a small fire just to make brews and to keep me warm, and I'm going to set that up underneath the tarp. If I protect the fire from the rain, it uses less fuel, and less fuel means less work. What I'm collecting are these. You see where the branch of this old pine goes into the stump. It's what you call a pine knot. These are full of resin. When you sniff them you can smell it. If you put those on the fire they burn brightly and give you a good blaze. These are exactly the sort of skills that Jim Bridger would have had to use. Staying up here for months on end, candles would have been a precious commodity. If you want light to work by in your cabin at night, pine knots were the old time solution. A few of these on the fire gives you a bright blaze. Now, as the sun's going down, this is the perfect time to use them. They'll give me a lot of light here. Also, they're very slow burning. And they're very reliable fuel, particularly if it's been raining. The spluttering of flames on the pine knots is a really comforting sight. They're a fascinating thing. The last time I came across anybody else using pine knots uh, was in Canada. I was traveling down a river and at the campsites, when I got to each campsite, I found pine knots that had been collected and left by the fireplace. Now this isn't something you see every day. This piece of bushcraft is one of those bits that are being forgotten. And I was intrigued by this. I never did catch up with the people who left those pine knots there. But it was interesting, there was a bond there between people who knew a similar resource. But at the end of my journey, I made a few inquiries to find out who else had been down the river recently. And it turns out that it was a group of Indians, native Canadians, who'd gone down the river to teach youngsters how to live in the bush. And one of them was using this skill. Bridger lived out here for months at a time. Apparently, he hated going to town. He found the beds too soft, and if he had to stay in a hotel, he'd sleep on the floor instead. This is just how he must have felt. Out in the wilds, not knowing what tomorrow might bring. In mountain meadows, mornings are beautifully still and quiet. But not today. 200 meters from my camp, there are dark shapes moving. This is a pack of wolves known as the Washakie Pack. Although this has been part of their territory for eight years, this is the first time that Tori has ever seen them.
You know, in all the time I've spent outdoors, I've seen plenty of tracks of wolves. I even saw a fresh dropping yesterday. But to see the animals themselves, well, they're very secretive. You can count those experiences on one hand. So that was a marvellous sight. And what I intend to do is, once I've had some breakfast, I'm going to saddle up right out over there and see what tracks they've left behind. I can't wait. I can see where they drag bits over that way as well. Yeah. Some more bone back there. It's coming this way. There's the rear pad. So they must have made the kill somewhere near here. There's a lot of disturbance here. Tori, how many wolves are there in this area? We saw six this morning and I think the pack is not much larger than that. There's been a few killed by control actions the last few weeks. At least four have died by the uh, actions of the government. So how do you feel about that? To kill the wolf just because he's doing what he does naturally by feeding on different things, in this case a calf elk, but in that case down there a domestic cow, I don't necessarily agree with that. To bring them back into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as we have done here is a tremendous success story and it is going to take give and take on everyone's part, but four wolves for the price of one cow, it seems a little excessive to me. Yeah, I think I'd agree with you. I don't know whether you can see that, but down there, that is not a dog dropping. That's a dropping from the wolves. We followed the trail that they left all the way from the kill site up to here. And uh, I can see further very fine disturbances coming up the slope here. There's some, uh, there's some scuffing there. And they've gone up this way. These animals really are magical. If only you had more wild places for them. I can't believe how lucky we've been to see these wolves. To me the wolf is the ultimate symbol of the wild. To see them prospering in their habitat gives me real hope. I'm really impressed with these horses and their ability to negotiate this incredible terrain. But I can't imagine how difficult it would be to bring a horse and cart through here. The real secret of finding a way through these mountains lay with the native inhabitants. Jim Bridger's close ties with the many Indian tribes who lived across this land were crucial when it came to pioneering a road to the west. From their unsurpassed knowledge of bushcraft, he learned the techniques that he needed to overcome the many obstacles in his way. There are thousands of kilometers of rivers to negotiate. The local way to travel down rivers or across them was using something called a bull boat, which is the North American equivalent of a coracle. And for the hull, the covering of it, what they used was this, a buffalo skin. Fresh buffalo hide like that. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a bull boat and see how they are in the water. First job is to lay this out and gauge the size of the boat. You have to be adaptable using wood that is locally available. Willows grow abundantly on this riverbank. These stakes mark out how big the frame will be. I can move this hide out of the way now. 
put that in the shade somewhere. And now I can start to construct the boat itself. For that, the first job is to put a hoop, a willow hoop, in the base of these four sticks. Willow is the perfect wood to work with because it's so flexible. The frame of the coracle can be lashed together with all sorts of materials, but I'm going to use this, which is rawhide, rawhide lacing. And this has been made moist, so it's flexible. As it dries, it will go stiff and it will shrink and bind the materials tightly together. Rawhide is just animal skin that's been cleaned and stripped of its hair. Many Indian tribes relied heavily on the buffalo for their livelihood, using every single part of the animal. And now I'm going to put the ribs in, which give it a lot more strength. And gradually it'll come to shape. Finding the willow quite difficult this time of year. It's certainly a lot uh, drier than it would have been a month or so ago. But that's all part of the challenge when you work with these sorts of materials. What I want to do is to start to fit in some ribs. And I want these to have, not to be round underneath, I want the, the bottom of the boat to be flat if possible. It'll be a little bit more stable. The number of ribs will vary according to the boat and uh, that's not looking too bad at the moment. So I think I'm going to put a few cross ribs, now long ones, in and see where that takes us. Have a look. Nice up right. I took the hoop out because it's easier to bend the willows without it there, but I have to put it back to make the structure sturdy. Once the edges are tidied up, I leave the rawhide to dry and tighten in the sun while I fashion a needle to sew the hide into the willow frame. As long as you've got sharp tools with you, it's simple to make everything you need from the available materials. There are uh, two ways of attaching the hide. You can just tie it on on the inside to the ribs or you can do like I'm doing here, which is to sew it on around the edge. I think this is the more sturdy method, perhaps the way Jim Bridger would have organised his boat. Where the ribs protrude, I'm just scoring a cross shape through the hide there and then pushing the skin down on that so it helps peg it in place. This is the tail, and the tails were left on so that when several boats are in use, these could be used to tie them together. Sort of a, a ready-made painter, if you like. The river is flowing fast, so I'm going to need a strong paddle. I'm hoping this piece of wood will make a paddle. Depends whether I can split it or not but uh, I didn't fell it, beavers felled this. You can see their, their teeth marks where they've taken it down. So they're helping me out. What I'm doing, I'm just making simple wedges. A bit of board here lying around, ideal. The principle of bushcraft is that always make the tool that makes the job easier. Trying to do it without investing the time in making a tool is uh, the hard way.
Well, that's more or less it. It's just a crude paddle. It's not a, a, a big plush one for paddling a canoe. But it's better to carve a paddle like this from a solid piece of wood than to do the, the opposite, which is to take a, a sapling and split it and put a board in and lash it in. This is much stronger and more stable. And the water I'm going to be moving the boat on, well, it's shifting. And I just like that little extra bit of security of a proper paddle. So, what, an hour to make it? It's nothing really, is it? It was a boat just like this one that Jim Bridger built when he went on his major expedition down the Bear River. Not an easy boat to steer, by all accounts. And they were a bit tippy, so I'm going to get in very carefully, a bit gingerly even. Yeah. Very tippy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's all right. It handles surprisingly well, quite responsive. It's a brilliant piece of ingenuity. Bridger was a man of action, not words. He built one of these to settle a bet about the course of the Bear River. With his boat complete, he hopped in and set off. Following the river through the mountains, he saw a huge lake. The story goes that his boat seemed more buoyant than before, so he tasted the water and found that it was salty. He was the first white man to discover Utah's Great Salt Lake. Actually, they're actually very manoeuvrable once you get the hang of it. It's just about sculling. Fantastic. You've got to hand it to Bridger and his pioneering spirit. He must have taken some guts to set off in something as flimsy as this, never knowing what might be waiting for him round the next bend. Today, there are still a few mountain men left. This is Jake Carell. He's a trapper who grew up here and has worked these mountains for years. And how long have you been trapping? 83 years. I started years. when I was seven and I'm now 90. <laughs> I'm still at it. You don't look 90. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of young guys can't keep up with me what I do, you know. <laughs> I don't never chum around with people my age. I can't stand them. They slow me up too much. <laughs> <laughs> Any changes in your life as you've grown older? Well, my sex life changed. I, I can plow as deep as I ever could, but I can't make as many rhymes. <laughs> 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 and looks like the traps are missing. I bet I got one here. Uh -huh. I see the wire going in. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll pull it up. We might have something here. Yeah, I got yeah. a a kit beaver. A little old kit beaver, and he's about three between three and four months old. By the time they're six months old, they do almost as much uh, damage as a, an old big beaver does. Jake, have you ever caught yourself in one of these traps? Yeah, I'll show you my fingers. They, they, and several times they went off, and, and after so many times, why, they don't heal too good anymore. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people think we're cruel people because we're trappers, but I think we're some of the best conservationists they've got, you know. You have to have a control on these animals. Uh, I, I don't believe in extincting any species. I, 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 I do know that you have to have a control on them because if you don't, boy, they'll take over and, and uh, then nobody can raise a crop or, or raise livestock and different animals are, are killers, you know, and the beaver are 
they do a lot of damage. I leave the ones alone that aren't doing any, any damage, you know. We're off to skin the beaver. Jake makes a living the same way as Bridger would have done. And as you watch him, you can see that he's every bit the expert. See, you only make one cut straight on through when you're skinning a beaver. His craftsmanship is born out of years of practice. It's exactly this level of knowledge that the mountain men relied upon. Uh, it's good meat. Uh, uh, the mountain men, if they were short on meat, they ate all beaver meat, but uh, uh, they always liked to mix elk and deer and stuff like that, moose, and once in a while butcher the bear for the fat. Nice beaver. <laughs> Watching Jake, it's hard to believe that he's actually 90 years old. I just got a little, little ways to go here, and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, put it on a, on a hoop, just like the mountain men did in the early days. The only difference, we use iron now, and they used willows. Here, here. On Bridges' very first expedition, a colleague of his called Hugh Glass had a run-in with a grizzly bear that nearly cost him his life. He was mauled and left for dead, with all but the bare minimum of his possessions. Stranded alone in the wilderness and horribly injured, Hugh Glass worked miracles that became a legend. Finding his razor, in his possibles bag, he used it to create sparks to get a fire going. Something like. Hammer them in and hook them, hook them on there. See, that's the way we hoop them. Well, you gotta have it just taut. If you have it too tight, uh, the, that'll kind of warp, and sometimes it'll rip these out. So you gotta have a little, little bit. Uh, a little bit loose there. When that's dry, that'll be solid, you know. And uh, so you got to know the right tension. Same way when you're building a drum, you got to have it about that loose because if you make it plumb tight, uh, it'll it'll bust while it's drying. The Indians killed white men that way. They sewed wet rawhide around their head and staked them out on an ant hill. And uh, when that uh, when that shrunk. Uh, why, then, then their brain swelled up and they died. Wouldn't that be a hell of a way to die? I'd rather die from a jealous husband or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Get us going, shouldn't it? The old cowboys used to. See? See, that helps. Yep. See how it works? And if the cowboys were riding where there's a lot of dry land, they'd let their horse drink out of their hat. <laughs> We'll just let that yeah, uh, go for that. now.
What have we got in there? Peach gobbler and uh, beaver stew. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to burn it. Let's have a look. No, oh, the, look at that. That's the stew. <laughs> there you go, Jake. Good, good, yeah. Right, Got so. a good scald on it. Mm -mm. Got a good flavor to it. Jim Bridger was a renowned storyteller. Mm. Jake is no different. Well, Jake, what, what about when you were a, a young man? Yeah, um, I've been clocked two or three different times where I walked uh, 40 miles in one day. Uh, uh, one, one of them, i got to tell you the story about this. I, I got done early with my hunters, and John Bradford had a hunting camp up on Togarty Pass, and uh, there was a, a, a quite a group of Mormons came in there, and they had a guy from a BYU football player. They was all telling what a hell of a tough guy he was and how far he could walk. And, and John Bradford knew me real well, you know. He, he said, well, you guys can brag your man up all you want. He'll never outwalk that guy right there. He pointed to me, you know. And, oh, they said, uh, you want to make a bet? And John said, yeah, what, uh, how much you want to bet? And there were several hundred dollars bet, you know. And so we left it. Uh, in the dark, we had a flashlight, and I walked over to Cottonwood Bench, which was 20 miles. And boy, it was right on my butt all the way. And coming out, we were about halfway out, and I looked over my shoulder, and I couldn't see him. So I walked back, and, and there he was sitting by a little, a little stream, and had his shoes off, and, and he had blisters on his feet. And he said, you win. He said, you, you go on, I'll hobble on in. And, and you know, I dog trotted on out and saddled two horses and went and got, went back and got them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so old, old John Bradford, he said, "See, I told you guys, there wasn't nobody gonna outwalk Jake." <laughs> Like Jake, Jim Bridger spent his lifetime exploring this area. Every valley might be the key to finding a way through to the west. Following in his footsteps, I can see how difficult it must have been to find a way through for the wagon trains. It would have been impossible without the support of the local inhabitants, the Shoshone, a tribe with an incredibly strong tradition of helping fellow travellers. Leo, a leading member of the tribe, is making jerky from elk meat in the traditional way. How do you do your, 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 your jerky? What's your method? What I do is cut all the way through this without cutting my fingers. Yep. And uh, you just try to kind of have a feel. These, these knives are just razor sharp. Yep. But we want this meat just as thin as we could get it. So you decide to unroll it, aren't you? Yeah, we want it as big and as thin as we could get it. These bits here. I remember way at the head of this canyon up on top here is some of the first time I remember making dry meat. Yeah. My dad was up there and that's all we did is he'd kill, kill an elk or something and there's no refrigeration up there at all so we just jerked it all. Once the meat is sliced thinly enough, you hang it onto a simple drying rack and season it. Here's one of these ones that you've done. I'm gonna have to, that's a handful there. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it's supposed to be done. This ain't the first time you ever done this. <laughs> you almost got her filled up. I don't think there's nothing better than jerky just being out here air cured. Mm -hmm. So I'll get a little fire going. Yeah, once we get a good fire going, we'll take some green grass and throw on it yeah. 
and I'll dye it back down, and then I'll be just a smudge coming up. Or some juniper branches, maybe. Yeah, yeah that would work. That would be good, wouldn't it? Excellent. We don't want to cook the meat with the fire. It's just there to help keep the flies off. I've spotted exactly the right thing to light the fire with. This is clematis. It reminds me of where I grew up in the south of England. During the fall, right through to the spring, you find this on the bushes there too. And this downy part, which people often call old man's beard for obvious reasons, is excellent for fire lighting. There are more than 200 clematis species that grow from Europe to Asia. One of the great things about bushcraft is that skills you learn in your back garden can be used all over the world. Okay, I'm going to grab one of these two. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Smoke from juniper branches yeah. will drive insects away and infuse the meat with a delicate flavour. Yeah, that looks real good. With the protein taken care of, I've asked Leo to show me how the Shoshone preserved vitamins through the winter months. We gathered up some of these choke cherries on our up here and we're going to make some choke cherry patties. And what I'm going to do is just put a few of them in here. And the leaves, bark and seeds contain a poison called hydrocyanic acid which is neutralized when prepared like this but also helps to act as a preservative. You have to put them out to dry, so I'm making the rack that we'll be needing. The sticks need tying together, and there are plenty of natural materials around for that. This stunningly red-coloured plant here is the red osier dogwood. And like all dogwoods, you can do the little dogwood test, which is to break the leaf into two parts. And in the veins there's a, of the leaf, there's a latex, which holds them together like that. You can see there, they're not coming apart. It, um, it's quite a toxic plant. It's not one that we would normally eat, although native people did eat the berries. You can see they're white. And um, they are in incredibly bitter certainly wouldn't want to eat many of those. More importantly though, it makes a very good withy for binding things together. It's incredibly flexible and that's what I'm using it for. What I'm making is a drying rack so that we can dry some fruit over the slow fire there by the jerky. You can see how effective these withies are as binding material. I really don't know why we use so much man-made cordage. And there's so many good natural alternatives that we can use when we come out into the countryside. And in a pristine area like this, it's far better to use these sort of natural materials which will grow back rather than leaving some piece of nylon cord here. Well, that's quite a rack you made there. It's yeah. doing a good job. It takes a little while to make these 
paddies. With that job done and the temperature dropping quickly, we have to get the teepee up before the sun goes down. Teepees have been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. These lightweight, movable shelters were perfect for migratory hunters. The poles could be transported or cut on arrival at a new campsite. See, I was trying to get the, the door facing the yeah. east. Always east. Yeah. And then move your back around. The door always faces yeah. east to greet every new dawn. Yeah. We can go ahead and start with that one right here, Ray, if you want to. Leo still uses them whenever he's out in the back country. Like that. A bit short, though, isn't it? What I'll have you do now, yep. I'll get a hold of this tent and take it and see if you can stick it in that little hole up in there. Yep. Anywhere. The pole. Yeah. Yep. Ready? Oh, I'll take this. I'll take the weight away from you. That hole left. Yeah, that'll work. Perfect. Okay, then we'll just go ahead and walk this on around to the front. You're a little taller than I am. Yeah, no. You can get up there and tie this yep. in a lot. But all right. Yeah, that'd be fine. Take a little fat Indian like me, we just can't reach that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a neat arrangement, isn't it? I mean, I think that's a really elegant system of, of you know, lacing a tent up. What I'm surprised is that nobody's used that method on other types of tents. I'll be doing it. Because it, it's so simple and effective. Mm -hmm. You know, if you lose a stick, it's easy to repair, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, they hold up so good in the wind. Uh, yeah. We want to pull that tent out inside here, Ray. Yep, I'll come in. Maybe we just, you know, just kind of move them around just a little bit, just so we get... Yeah, that looks good. You can see that this teepee's been really well used. Maybe that other one on the other side, just take it towards the front there a little bit. This one? Yeah. I think this looks real good. And when we get outside, we'll... We'll pull it. We'll start from the front, driving the first stake. Yep. And we'll pull it out tight, and then we'll work our way back. Go ahead and put the first front one in. That put, way. Yeah. Put them on a slant. Of course, the original ones were made of skins, weren't they? Yeah, they were. And it still amazes me how they could have packed them around, because. God, it had to have been heavy. I don't know how heavy that boat you built, but I bet it was pretty heavy, and that was just one hide. It was just one hide, yeah. The bull boat was really heavy, and it would have taken about eight buffalo hides to make teepees this size. Leo, the, the lives of the Shoshone, the Crow, the Cheyenne, the other Plains tribes were very tightly bound up with the buffalo, weren't they? They were, and you know, like uh, history says, and then what the people around here that uh, this was their main source of food, the buffalo, the great numbers. And uh, when the white men did come, they figured that if they killed the buffalo, they killed the Indian. And I think it worked. And this is just some of the remains of what, of probably the early days, of what what was here, you know, and. As you look here, that's the marks that an Indian tribe, most likely Shoshones, had chopped into his head and took his brains, probably for brain tanning of the hides. So they've taken the brain out here right. to tan the, the, the hide of the animal into clothing. Right, that's what they... That's amazing. Along with the buffalo, the Native American culture itself nearly died out after years of persecution. Thankfully, people like Leo are keeping it alive. <laughs> Jim Bridges spent many hours around the fire, forging close ties with the tribes in this region. He was fluent in many Indian languages, as well as Indian Sign Language. Together, they shared their knowledge of these mountains.
part of the magic of bushcraft is just coming out and looking around, getting to grips with the environment, seeing what the potential is. Just down here, there are lots of fish rising, there are cutthroats in there. And uh, it doesn't mean to say that we have to come always and catch them. It's about enjoying the fact that they're there, looking at the real potential of the landscape. It brings us very close to nature in a way that no other outdoor pursuit can. This is always the best time of day to explore an area. Before the sun gets too high in the sky, you've got much more chance of seeing wild animals. What a beautiful sight. Bighorn sheep in their natural environment. And it's quite interesting because in this part of the world, the Shoshone here were often called sheep eaters. One of the things that they used to use the sheep for was making bows. The males have massive horns that come, come right up and curl around, and they would cut out a tapering strip from each horn, which they could then straighten out, glue together, and back with sinews, with tendons, to make an incredibly powerful bow. There are even accounts of Indians riding alongside a buffalo and shooting an adult with this bow, and the arrow passing clean through the adult and killing a calf alongside. It gives you some idea of how powerful they were. The Shoshone that lived here had a very special relationship with their environment. They valued the resources that Mother Earth provided and tried always to take only what they needed from the land. Well, this jerky looks quite good now. It sure does. What do you think? Time to pack it away? Yeah, I think so. I think we could start. I'll we tell you what, with that wind coming, it makes me think winter's nearly here, isn't it? I'm going to try a little bit of this jerky because it's looking really good. Whoa. That's fantastic. And then when it gets a little bit drier, you know, we could put it up on your rack like you have here and we'll build another fire and we'll use maybe some aspen or different types of flavoring and flavor it a little bit. Well, I mean, this tastes better than anything you can buy. This beautiful flavor of the smoke there. I mean, that's great. It is. Oh, it tastes so good. I wish I put a little bit more salt on it. Oh, I, I don't know. I like it. That's excellent. Really nice. And how long would they keep that for them? Oh, this would, uh, they would keep this all winter long. Fantastic. Just have to force it down in these. What's that bag made out of? This is made out of elk feet. That's beautiful. I wish we had a chance to uh, bring one up. We could have made one for you. That would have been nice to see. That. Maybe in the next time. Another time, Leah. Another time, yeah. I'm back on Jim Bridger's trail. Not long ago, he would have relied upon the hospitality of the Shoshone to find a path through these mountains. It's ironic that opening these paths to the wagon trains nearly brought about the demise of the very people who had shown the way. Over 65 million bison or buffalo once roamed this country. A massive extermination of the species was launched in order to destroy the native peoples who depended upon them. By 1900, only a handful of wild buffalo remained. Fortunately, not all the bison in America were killed in the Great Culls. There are still herds to be seen today. But sadly, we can only wonder at the sight of a herd so big you could ride all day on a fast horse and never get to the head of it. The tribes knew the routes and patterns of migrating animals, setting strategic hunting camps in the same places every year. There are still signs of the people who were displaced. These stones were used to hold down the outside of a teepee. This is one of 20 or more sites like this just on this ridge here on Table Mountain. And what these are believed to represent are the, the stones left where a tent was erected by native people here probably in the winter because they tend to have rather deep fire pits in the middle of them. What we do know is that this area here was and still is a migration route for many wild species. So it could well be 
that this was a site and maybe a winter encampment of hunters intercepting those animals. There are other more mysterious signs. This ring of stones here, in, in one expert's opinion, would once have been a stone wall that stood maybe this high in a circle. It was an eagle trap. And inside this, a young man would hide, hidden by sticks and grasses put across the top, on top of which would be a dead animal. When an eagle came down to get it, he'd reach up and grasp it by its talons, and then he could pull out the feathers from the bird for ceremonial use and then release it. They lived in balance with their environment and respected men like Jim Bridger for adhering to the same ideals. For generations, Native Americans have traveled this continent, finding the best routes and passing that knowledge from clan to clan. It was they who, in the middle of the 19th century, showed Jim Bridger and the mountain men the easiest way to cross the Rocky Mountains. In doing so, they unlocked the route to the Pacific for the pioneers, a place called South Pass. It was the key to the westward migration and the expansion of America. Without it, wagon travel across the continent would have been impossible. I don't think it would do any good to try and thumb a lift on this road. There hasn't been much traffic through here for a long while. But for a short period in American history, this was one of the busiest roads on the continent. 500,000 people came along here, heading west in search of brighter futures. In fact, the last wagon came past in 1912, which somehow just seems like yesterday. I guess this route through the mountains will always be associated with the mountain man, Jim Bridger, because he's the man credited with pioneering it. But it was, in fact, the Indians who showed him the way. What I think is important is the wisdom of that old mountain man. He knew the value of respect. He showed the Indians respect, and in return, they respected him. Little Britain next here on BBC Two and over on BBC Four. Archive footage combines with diary extracts to provide an insight into Hitler's propaganda minister. Dr. Goebbels speaks starting now. And Ray Mears has written a book to accompany his bushcraft series with detailed information on survival techniques from cultures around the globe.